what's rehab like? It's almost like a little uh, little socialist farm almost. <laughs> huh. We get to do all sorts of cool stuff. Like last month we went skiing. In a couple of weeks we get to go go-karting. Like I, I say it's worth it. <laughs> I'm about to move to Canada, get a job, and get my ass fired. That sounds awesome. Call from Benjamin. Hello. Hello. What's going on? Not much. I'm calling you from rehab. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm two months in. Two months sober as of last Friday. Um, what's what's rehab like? Uh, it's been good so far. I mean, I've got an eight-month-old daughter, so it's pretty hard being here away from her. But um, it feels good to have been sober for her for the last two months. So that's been awesome. What is this alcohol that we're talking, or something else? Uh, it was alcohol and like copious amounts of pot, like insane marathon smokers amounts of pot. <laughs> Interesting. Like, uh, for about five years, I smoked like an ounce to two ounces a day. You smoked an ounce of pot a day for five years? Yeah. Sorry. I'm yeah, out of a bong that. too. That's crazy. It's all good. Yeah, it was nuts. Like, and it was not good for me. <laughs> an ounce of pot a day. Oh, my God. Sorry, I don't mean to. Yeah, hence, I feel like I'm making fun of you. But I mean, no, I mean, no. I'm, I don't. I'm. I mean, that's undeniable. That's 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 a lot. That's wild. Yeah, that is. Because when you said pot, I was like, I don't. I've never heard of someone in re. I mean, I, uh, obviously, alcohol people are going to rehab for it all the time. But I've never heard somebody in rehab for for pot, and I mean, an ounce is how do you afford that? Holy shit! That's like an ounce of pot is like a hundred bucks, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well. um... Yeah, it's a fair amount. I grew a lot of it myself. I'm up in Canada, so it's pretty okay. easy to grow it and get away with it. And um, yeah, a lot of it, I just, I made money. Like I was in school for a while, but I was also making money on the side. I had a lot of savings. So I kind of just burned through a lot of money really fast. Mm, mm, okay. Um, so uh, what were you, were you, were you selling what you grew? Or I mean, you know, you can plead the fifth on that if you want. Oh wait, you guys don't have the fifth. You don't have the fifth. You're yeah. fucked. No, no. I, I was I was selling it, not super not legally, but uh, I definitely was. Um and that helped fund a lot of it. And then you know, I had buddies. I went through a couple jobs where I like used my job as leverage to get pot. Like <laughs> I managed a campground for a while and doing that, like it was near a bunch of um indigenous dispensaries, so I'd let the indigenous guys come in and use the boat launch for free and they'd give me like That's pretty cool. <laughs> an ounce of pot a day. So Look, forgive me for my ignorance, but does Canada even have laws and jail and stuff? Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have laws. There, there are, like, a lot of laws around weed. Like, right now, if you buy edibles at a dispensary, you can't get a single edible over, like, 10 milligrams. Really? So there are, there's weird, yeah, there's really weird laws. But you can buy, like, two ounces of weed. So, okay. <laughs> it's weird. So you can, you can buy for you a two-day supply of weed? Oh, yeah, easily, yeah. And if I like, you can go to multiple dispensaries. You could have like ten ounces by the end of the day if you wanted to. Hmm. Where is that? What you were doing? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. An it ounce was, of weed a day through a bong. Yeah. Yeah. Like hard. And like near the end, I started doing diamonds. So I'd like heat up a spoon with a butane torch till it got cherry red, and then like drop diamonds onto the spoon. And then inhale that through like a milk jug that I'd cut half off, like a like, half gram at a time. What's a, what's a diamond? It's like 98% THC distilled into a crystal. <laughs> it's, it's hardcore. That you know what's hilarious is like they you can't overdose on weed, but it's I don't it, it, it you are proof that you cannot overdose on weed. <laughs> I mean, yeah, basically. If you could, you would have you would have been super dead. Yeah, no, no kidding. I would have. And I mean, like, I had other crazy times when I did tons of weed. Like, one day I took a thousand milligrams of edibles at once. Jeez. And, like, I, that felt like I was going to die. That was nuts. <laughs> a thousand milligrams of... I would feel like for you, after all this smoking, your tolerance would be such that a thousand milligrams would be like if I took fucking ten. Yeah, like, well, I also took two tabs of acid at the same time. So oh, okay, you didn't mention that. Yeah, that, that, yeah, it was a, it was a wombo combo. <laughs> so, what was the what? Why, why? Why were you? Why were you smoking an ounce of weed a day? If you even have an answer to that question. Oh yeah, I definitely do. Like, okay, I'm gonna go back a little bit. I've always been addicted to something, 
like even when I was a little kid, I, like my parents were very much like they didn't allow me to have video games. They didn't allow me to eat sugar, all sorts of stuff. So I like I didn't know how to regulate my own dopamine kind of. Yeah. So like I remember even at like five or six years old, I'd read a book and I like try to reread the book to get the same enjoyment out of it. But of course he wouldn't. I get like frustrated and angry at the book. Or like um, when I did finally start being able to play video games, I get really angry when a video game didn't satisfy me the same way. Um, and I didn't start drinking and smoking until I was about 19. Uh, started smoking when I entered university, started drinking when I entered in university. And uh, yeah, this whole time I was smoking, I was also drinking like 20 to 40 drinks a week. So it was a lot. Uh, and then of course, like university got stressful. I was still doing super well, but um, like the stress would just get to me. So for a couple of years, I was just smoking and drinking on the weekends. Then that started to become during the week. And then that started becoming like every day, morning and night. Um, and then most recently, I was in a PhD in experimental psychology. Um, I did my first year in that. And then I just realized I hated what I was doing. <laughs> and after I dropped out of that, it got really bad because I just had nothing left to do. And I had tons of savings. So that's when I really started smoking like an ounce a day. Uh, and yeah, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't stop. I tried for a long time. When my daughter was born, I thought that would give me the motivation to stop. And it helped me slow down a bit, but I definitely couldn't stop. And then I just relapsed going back to like an ounce a day. Um, and then finally, uh, yeah, some stuff happened with my wife that was kind of like rock bottom for me. Uh, got like super drunk one night, things went off the rails. And she finally told me, you know, what, you better just smarten up her. <laughs> you got you to gotta go to rehab or something or it's over between us and you're not going to get to see your daughter. So. I just, I, I said, yeah, you, I need help at this point. Went to rehab. Mm. Um, and you've been here for two months. Yeah, I've been sober for two months. Yeah. How it's you a, feeling? It's a year long program. Uh, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. Like I'm definitely used to being sober now. Um, I kind of worry that I've just transferred to other addictions. Cause like I've started going to the gym like two hours a day to fill up my time and that kind of worries me that when I get out, I'm just going to like work out constantly just to stave off the anxiety. But I've only two Wait months in two. So you're, I... you're worried that you're going to fucking get jacked. <laughs> but like my goal while I'm being here is to like get to the point where I'm not addicted to anything. Like there's not one thing that I just have to do every day or I'll go absolutely nuts. So like, I want to be able to exercise and work out. But I don't want it to like, I, if I miss a day, I don't want to like freak out and get crazy anxiety or something. It's, I'm, I'm sorry I'm stupid is is anyone not addicted to any like anything like is there anyone out there who has no addictions at all even if, yeah, if no. we can consider we can consider going to the gym an addiction yeah yeah no you're right you're right like everybody has something that they just have to do um I've just like everything I've done in my life has got I've gotten crazy compulsive about like I used to, I used to also go to the gym a ton when I was 19 or 20 and I would go like two hours a day, six days a week. And then I finally, like <laughs> one night I arm wrestled 14 guys in a row with both arms. When I got up the next morning, I'd, I'd blown out both my shoulders and I couldn't work out at all. And it just destroyed me. Like you I was are. super depressed for months and like, I just, I had no self-esteem after that. So like, I don't want to get super wrapped up in just one thing like that again and then just be completely left down if it becomes impossible to do you know wait you you hold on you are i i you ended that talking about how depressed and low self-esteem you were but i was i didn't catch that part because i was trying to in, like you arm wrestled 14 guys with both like you were like they like seven guys in each in oh. a line and you're like what is what is that yeah yeah no it was my it was my first so i did a year of bible college before i went to university and we had like this first men's getting to know each other retreat type thing. We all decided to arm wrestle and just nobody could beat me because I was like 210 pounds at the time. I just arm wrestled like 14 people because none of them could beat me. <laughs> and then I got up the next morning and I literally couldn't lift my like my arms above my shoulders because I had blown out both rotator cuffs. You got like arm it wrestle gang banged. <laughs> literally. <laughs> Huh. So yeah, I'm just super obsessive about everything, and that's that's one of the reasons I'm in rehab, and I'm trying to trying to get that in in order. Hmm. Um, when your daughter was born eight months ago. Yep. Yep. 
Um, how and okay, and so in this, this is a year long program. Uh, and so are you? What's the deal with it? Is it like okay, I'm. How do I say this? Are you? So it's like, is it like a sleepaway camp type of vibe, or like, are you? What are you doing for this whole year? Yeah, it, it's it's kind of unique. It's not like a lot of rehab centers. Uh, it's actually a working farm. So I'm on this giant farm, um, and I'm here for a year, and they kind of split it up into three quarters. So the first or four quarters. So the first quarter is just like getting your health in order, getting back into exercising, trying to eat well. Uh, the second quarter, you do a lot of like AA style stuff, uh, therapy. Um, the third quarter, you can start to like work again and like get your job and stuff. So it, it's like a really, a really integrated program. It's not like most places where they just bring you in and like tell you to sober up and then kick you out the door when you're done. <laughs> There's a lot more, uh, a lot more going on, especially in like the later, the later months of being here. They like help people find jobs and like help people get their driver's licenses back and all sorts of stuff. Mm-hmm. Okay. But yeah, so I, I live here and then I get to go home on the weekends to my partner and my daughter, which is awesome. So I'm there from like Friday to Sunday and then I come back here Monday to Friday. Interesting. And, and do you have a job while you're doing this? Are you working? Uh, I work in the kitchen here. So I work like 25 to 30 hours a week just cooking for all the other guys here. I cook wow. dinner. Okay. And, do they, and do they pay you on top of like, how does how does that work? <laughs> No, we pay to be here. <laughs> we don't get we okay. don't get paid for our work here. But uh, luckily in Canada, in the province I'm in, actually, you can claim EI like employment insurance uh, for medical causes for substance abuse. So my doctor just signed off saying that like I needed rehab, and the government pays me like I think it's like twenty three hundred bucks a month just to be here. So it completely covers the cost of rehab plus more. Okay, so you're not going out of out of uh, you're not losing you. So the government basically paid for you to go to rehab? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. Fucking 10 points for Canada, goddamn. Right? And it's, it's not in every province either. I'm lucky. I'm in British Columbia, so they were one of the few provinces that does that. Are you near Vancouver? Yeah, I'm coming to your show in June. You're coming to the show? Ah, there we go. Okay, that's what I was going to ask. You're coming to the show. Hell yeah. I'm going to wear all green, so if you see me in the audience, I'm in green sweatpants, green hoodie, green tube, green everything. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Well, look, here's the thing. You're not going to need um, all that weed anymore, so if you want to bring it to the show and give it to me, I would gladly accept it. <laughs> I threw out all my weed a while, a long time ago. But, that's uh, right, you did. Yeah, yeah I, I'm not going to let myself go near it again. Um... Okay, so how what do you actually do every day? Yeah, well, like, so it's a kind of a weekly schedule. So Mondays and Fridays in the mornings, we have classes. Uh, it can range from anything from, like, I've done relaxation therapy. We've done anger management courses. We've done uh, something called smart recovery, which is kind of like AA. Um, and then for in the evenings, you do some kind of, like, group therapy or, le- like, class. So tonight we had a sharing group where we just get together with a couple of the guys that are in the rooms around us and talk to them about our week. Uh, Wednesday nights they have a speaker come in. Uh, Thursday night the one guy gets up and like shares his whole life story to everybody else. And then basically all the other time during the day we're all working different jobs around the farm. So like some guys work in a greenhouse, some guys work in a barn, um, some guys do woodworking, some guys do pottery. I work in the kitchen, which I really love. But yeah, everybody just kind of splits up and we all do different things and. It's almost like a little, uh, little, little socialist farm, almost. <laughs> huh? Are you? Um, yeah. What did now? What did you do for work before you went to rehab? Oh man, I, I did a lot of stuff. Um, like I said, I was in a PhD in experimental psychology for for a year. I realized I hated that. Uh, I dropped out of that, and that's where I met my partner, who would I who I would later have a daughter with. So we moved back to BC. Um, I started working at a campground for a while when we were living out of my truck camper, like with solar panels and the whole thing at this campground. Um, I did that for about a year, and then we found out she was pregnant. So I quit that because we couldn't raise our daughter in a truck camper. <laughs> um, and then I got a job that is actually, that was a, it had a business owned by my best friend at an auto recycler. And I was training to go into sales there to sell uh, car engines and um, transmissions and all sorts of stuff. I did that for about a year, and then my mental health was just getting so bad with all the drinking and the smoking, and like the stress of my daughter just added to all that. And I just quit my job, and then, but a month later, I just crashed, hit rock bottom, and then that's when I was just kind of forced to come to rehab. But 
It's a good thing I did. <laughs> mm. So kind of just bounced around for a long time. Do you have, what is your, do you have like a, a plan for the future of like what you want to do when you get out? Yeah, I, I'm not sure yet. I've only been here a couple months, so I'm kind of just stabilizing right now. I mean, I haven't really figured out exactly what I want to do. Um, my partner is in, in school right now, and she, we're, we're kind of we're kind of opposites. She loves having a job and working and having the same sort of routine every day, um, and I hate that. <laughs> so what we're actually hoping in the future is I'd, I'd love to be a stay-at-home dad, and we both want to have like a little farm one day where we grow plants and have animals and stuff. So hopefully down the road she can be the the breadwinner, and I can just take care of her kids and do the housework and cook and clean, and that's. That's kind of what I love to do, if I'm being honest. Mm. Um, hmm. So, what what does she do again? She is a student right now. Um, she's actually indigenous. So, while she's in school, she's getting funding from her band and from the government to go oh, to really? school. So, she's basically, get, she's basically getting paid to go to school. She gets like four grand a month. <laughs> so, the, so the, Canadian, um, the Canadian government pays for her to go to school and stuff? Well, they don't pay her directly. They like give her band money, like her her specific indigenous group, and then huh. that they give her money out of that. And because she's going to school full time and she has a kid, they basically just decided to give her four grand a month. That's um, pretty sweet. So yeah, we we're we're doing pretty good. Like financially, we're okay. Neither of us has to work. She just studies full time and takes care of the baby. And I, well, I'm in rehab, so I just kind of do my thing here and then do everything I can to help on the weekends. When you said doing pretty good, I finally heard your Canadian accent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it doesn't come out as much on the West Coast, but I guess, yeah. Um, hmm. So, are you making are you making friends in in rehab? The way that you described it as like kind of a commune farm, it sounds like a a, a place that would foster um, you know, connections of some kind. Are you finding that to be true? Totally, yeah, yeah. It's, it's definitely way different from other rehabs around here, where it's kind of just lock you up and get sober kind of thing. Um, honestly, like if you wanted to get drugs here, it'd be super, super easy. <laughs> they don't search you or anything, and like people can go home on the weekend. So it's more of a place that guys come to who like really, really are committed to staying sober and and working out things in their lives and trying to be happy. So as a right. result, like most of the guys here are like super social and. And it's really easy to make friends, yeah. Everybody's right, it's not like a court-ordered like, type of place. Not at all, not at all. That's cool. Like you, you, I've, I've broken down crying in front of guys here multiple times, and everybody's just, like, super supportive and, like, right there for you. It's, like it's really awesome. Yeah. You, you know, I always... So, sorry I'm complaining, but I, I have always... um. I wish I could go to rehab for, like, sugar. That, ex- that probably exists. Mm. Is that, does that exist? Can I go to rehab I mean, you, for you, being addicted to Reese's Cups? Is there a re- Reese's Rehab? Reese's <laughs> Rehab. Is there a Reese's Rehab? You could come. You can come here. They have they have people who come in for like sugar addictions. Like there's one guy who's just here because he was depressed. <laughs> so he just he just came here and they took him. <laughs> it's, really? It's pretty open. Yeah, it's pretty open to interpretation. Can I, now I now will his did his do you think his doctor let like wrote him a note saying you can your uh the government can pay for you to go to this commune to be not depressed or do you think he just went out of pocket uh i don't know in his case i i i don't think he could qualify like um if you get fired from your job you can qualify for ei too so if he just got himself fired maybe he's maybe he's getting ei through that and if those fail, you can also you can also try to apply for like social assistance or disability if you can prove you have some kind of disability too. But some guys do just pay out of pocket. It's only like twelve hundred bucks a month, which is pretty cheap considering everything's paid for. So and it's get... fun too. Like what it like we we get to do all sorts of cool stuff. Like last month we went skiing. In a couple of weeks we get to go go karting. Like none of, like it's all paid for through the program. So. I, I say it's worth it. <laughs> I'm about to move to Canada, get a job, and get my ass fired. That sounds awesome. <laughs> do it. <laughs> we can do rehab together. It'd be awesome. I would love to. You're. I would love to go to rehab with you. That would be great. <laughs> that would be great. But be although awesome. I will say, I will say, um, 
you know, go-karting and ski- You know what sucks, though, is that go-karting and skiing so much more fun while you're high. <laughs> you're absolutely right. Like, you're, you're 100% right. So that's the trade-off, right, but, but um... <laughs> huh. Oh, so you're feeling good? Are you feeling good about sobriety? You feel like you're going to be able to do the, the month? I mean, not oh, the month, yeah. but the well, year, we, the year. Yeah, totally. Like, honestly, I feel healthier and happier than I have for, like, the past five years. I've also, That's like, beautiful. I've given up a lot of, like, my misplaced ambition, too, which has been kind of freeing in a way. Like, when I was when I was in my PhD, it wasn't because I wanted to do it. It was just because I felt like I had to do it because I had all these expectations that I placed on myself and then other people had placed on me. So, like, coming to rehab, I'm actually deciding what's important to me personally and those things aren't as stressful as all the other things I've done in my life. So that's been kind of freeing. So like mentally and physically, honestly, I'm feeling better than I have in a long time. And I, I, I don't see substances being hard. Yeah, that's wonderful. I'm not a real therapist, but um, judging off the information that you gave me about you uh, getting arm wrestle gang banged by 14 guys, <laughs> um, you do. You definitely seem to have misplaced ambitions. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. I agree. That's beautiful, man. Fuck, it sounds like you're cured now, but you got to do the whole year just to make sure. Yeah, well, like, everybody has rough moments and rough days, too. Like, I'm only talking about the good stuff, but, I mean, I have days where, like, all I can think about is pot, too. And I just have to really struggle through it. Or, like, I'm in B.C., so when you're driving around, you smell pot, like, every five minutes. <laughs> mm -hmm. And just the smell comes into your car. So, like, when that happens, it, it's tough. And, like... I, I've been, a, I like, every time I leave, my partner's there with me, and she's keeping me sober, but if I was just on my own, I, I don't know. Like, it would it'd be a lot harder. So, I mean, if I left right now, I, I couldn't say that I'd stay sober. I definitely need more time here. It's not, not all sunshine and roses. <laughs> hmm. It's not all sunshine, roses, and go-karting. Yeah, go-karting for sure, but... It's at least a little bit go-karting. That's what we know. Yeah. Um, what the hell yeah. was I going to say? Oh, um, did you ever have a time in your life where you were able to, like, just smoke casually? Or was it always fucking nuts? Uh, yeah, well, like, I kind of transitioned from drinking super heavily to smoking super heavily. So when I was drinking super heavily, I would smoke maybe, like, once a month, and that was okay. But I was also drinking, like, 50, 60, 70 drinks a week. Like, just, just pounding them down. And then, like, my liver started to go a little bit, so I, I, I quit drinking and went to smoking, and that's when it got really out of control. Mm. Um, my liver's still kind of screwed, but I'm getting an ultrasound done on it, so hopefully it's okay. <laughs> what is we do you, how is, um, are there any, did your doctor tell you about any of the long-term effects of the ounce of weed a day? Uh, well, it, it messes up your lungs, that's for sure. Like, you couldn't go up a flight of stairs without feeling like crap and, like, when I quit, I coughed up resin from my lungs for about two weeks. My spit was just Whoa. brown, like packing up phlegm. And like when I quit, it was like hardcore withdrawal, hardcore withdrawal. I was like, because I was smoking like over an ounce a day through a bong. I didn't eat for like three weeks because I couldn't. I would throw up every time I ate solid food. I just drank whole milk. That was like all I could keep down. <laughs> and I didn't, I like... At the first week that I, I quit pot, I slept once every three days. And then the week wow. after that, it was once every two days. And then the week after that, I could only sleep like three hours a night and it just slowly got better. But for those first three weeks, like it was, it felt like hardcore drug addiction or drug like withdrawal. It was rough. Wow. And like anybody I... listening, like don't, don't get to the point that I was at because it's, it's bad. <laughs> it's really bad. Damn, you know, I, I I was gonna fucking take a rip of my dad pen after this, but now I'm not sure. <laughs> well, like anything, like anything can be used in moderation, but my problem is I'm really good at manipulating myself. So like, if I have one rip, I can convince myself that the next day I can have another rip and it's not a problem, and then I can convince myself that I can have two rips in a day and it's not a problem, and then I just spiral down from there. It's all about like if you have the mindset for for moderation, it makes all the difference. Um, I don't think gonna... weed in small small amounts really hurts. Oh, yeah, I don't know. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> you don't think weed in small amounts really hurts? Well, I guess. I mean, uh, I assume I, most. I don't. Most people who like you know get addicted or like are AA people or like have struggle with addiction. I think m most of them usually quit cold turkey for the rest of their lives rather than reintegrate it. I assume. 
Yeah, and that's what I want to do. Like, especially with my daughter. I like my yeah, parents didn't yeah. do the best job raising me, and my my like my biggest goal in life has been to be a good parent because I want to be able to really succeed in some of the places they failed. And when I couldn't quit when my daughter was born, that was really scary. And I, I never want to go back to that kind of fear of not being able to take care of someone. And I know you say all the time, like, if you have a kid, you're screwed. But like, for do me, I say that all the time? God damn. I... <laughs> <laughs> do I say that all the time? No, I had a call once with the. Uh... I feel bad that I say that all the time. I fucking say things on this podcast, and then people are like, remember when you said that? I'm like, I forgot anyone was listening to this. Um, what was I going to say? Um, no, I don't think you're screwed. You sound very not screwed. Um, oh, I, yeah. No, she changed my life for the better by far. She Can keeps me going every day. Yeah, I'm 26. And my, cool. my partner is 20, 21 or 22. So we're really young okay. to have a kid. And we've only known each other two years. <laughs> okay. Well, sounds like it's been an, 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 uh, an eventful two years. Yeah, you could say that. Um, okay. Um, and now you have your daughter. And you're excited to... Oh, I remember what I was going to ask you. Um... Your, you said your parents raised you in ways that you're not cool with. What it, Do you want to share any like uh, th- things you've learned from their mistakes that you're hoping to um, not – you're hoping to, to, to correct in your raising of your own daughter? Yeah, sure. Um, my parents were super, super legalistic religious growing up, like, like really hardcore. So um, like one example I can give is – Pretty much my earliest memory from childhood, I was maybe four or five years old and I was at church. I still remember like I was in the pews and I couldn't sit still because I was four or five years old. <laughs> like, you can't sit still in church when you're that young. And my dad was getting so ticked off at me that when we got home, he had me like sit in this little wooden wicker chair and I still have this chair. It's like this tiny little kid's chair. So I know I wasn't very old. And he was like, now you look at the clock. If you have to sit there for an hour without moving, and if I see you move, I'm resetting the hour. And I like I sat there all day because I I couldn't do it. And I just remember like going away from that with just this feeling of like, well, there's something wrong with me. Like if I can't if I can't sit still, there's something wrong with me. And my dad had to punish me. And like that just led to this huge complex growing up of insecurity, like feeling like I'm not good enough, feeling like I'm I, I should feel guilty about myself constantly. And like I don't want to teach my daughter that. I I, I don't want to let her get away with anything, but. I also like I'm not gonna ingrain just like this like this feeling of self hatred and self guilt. That's just not good for a kid. Yeah. What's your relationship with your parents like now? Uh it's a bit better. My dad like my parents had three kids after me and they did a much better job with those kids. <laughs> okay. They were also like nineteen and twenty when they had me and they came from super religious homes who like right. really came down on them for having a kid that young and not in marriage. So they had their own issues to work out. Um, so, like, my relationship with them is a little bit better now that now as a parent. Like, they come and visit me in rehab and stuff like that. Still argue with my mom all the time because she's like a hardcore anti-vax. Like, there's just, oh, oh, like, <laughs> all these things I disagree with. But um, like, we get along. We can we can sit sit at a dinner together and not yell at each other. So that's good. Getting that's kind. It's kind of interesting that you get older and you're and then you have that thing of like oh that was fucked up that my parents did that but also they were probably also had just had no fucking idea what they were doing yeah exactly (laughs) Mm. yeah i know and also the fact that you you recognize it as some kind of like cycle that you are now um have the have the glorious opportunity to break 100 percent, absolutely that's like my biggest goal right now Mm -hmm. um do you think what if they come out with a like a like weed two? Would you would you <laughs> try weed two if they if there was a sequel to weed, or would you be like, no, I'm no. Not gonna... I I'd want to. I definitely want to do it, but I I wouldn't like. I even I gave up like everything when I came here. I I don't even drink coffee anymore because I don't want to be on any substance whatsoever. Like I really just want to be able to get through my day on my own power, just enjoy things without any kind of substance. Like, I don't even drink, like, pop anymore. So I, I don't think weed, too, would draw me back in. <laughs> as much as I would love to try it, but... Weed, too, would be, like, a combination of all those things. It combines... It's, like, weed infused with 
soda infused with alcohol infused with Reese's pieces, and you oh, smoke they, they already it, have it makes like you feel all those things. I mean, I've had weed infused alcoholic drinks before, and those were pretty dope. But what yeah, is wait, you've had? What you you had? You've had? Okay, uh, hold on, just real well, quick. I, the, so I made my, I made my own. <laughs> you made okay. Al- weed infused alcohol makes sense logistically, but how the fuck do you make alcohol infused weed? Oh, okay, okay. No, I haven't made alcohol infused weed. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't think through that, but I have made. Weed infused alcohol. Okay, I, uh, I thought I you infused weed into. I, I infused weed into Everclear, and then I would take shots of that. I'm glad you're in fucking rehab, time. man. <laughs> yeah, me too, man. <laughs> um, goddamn. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I. Uh, the Lord has given you uh, another chance after your um. Weed infused Everclear. I'm glad to see you taking it. I'm glad to see that you're doing well. I'm massively impressed with you that, um, I mean, it sounds like it was a hellish road to get there, but, um, uh, just, yeah, I mean, going from five years of, of daily, uh, you know, craziness to, uh, you know, it sounds like you're in a really, really good place right now. After only two months, I mean, that's incredibly impressive, man. Good on you. Um, I, I wish. You and your family continued health and happiness throughout uh, your existence, and um, I'm, I'm going to see you in. in uh, I'm going to. We're going to meet each other in real life at fucking yeah, I'm so uh, pumped. soon. I'm pumped too. That'll be awesome. Everyone, I'm coming to Vancouver on uh, ah fuck sometime in June. TherapyGeckoTour.com. I'm going to Vancouver. I'm going to have a fun time. Um. We'll live life. We'll, um, I'll, I'll make sure just, just for, you know, I was, I was thinking about, um, starting a therapy gecko brand of weed infused alcohol and selling it at my shows, but just for you, I won't. <laughs> I appreciate that. It'll make it easier for me. What's your name again? My name's Ben. Ben? Ben, it was a pleasure talking yeah. to you, man. Is there anything else you want to say to me or the people at the computer before we go? Uh, I'd love to shout out my partner, Rochelle, if she's watching. I love you so much. You are everything to me. And uh, I listen to your podcast religiously, so I'm excited for the next episode. I listen to it while I'm in rehab cooking. (laughs) Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. I'm glad to hear that, man. You take care. You too, man. Ben forever. (laughs) Lyle forever. Oh, that was a great call. Oh, that was a great call. I love that guy. That uh, That was fascinating to me. Because, um, yeah, I could have talked to that guy forever. Uh, that was fascinating to me because, um, after, fu- I mean, that was some he- fucking heavy, serious, crazy thing. Like, an ounce of weed a day for five years, fucking infusing weed into every clip. I mean, that's crazy to me to be on that high level of addiction. And then only after two months be talking the way that, you know, that guy was talking to me for the half hour. Uh, seeming like he was in a good place. I was impressed by that. That gives me hope that, I, you know, I can go to Reese's rehab and, um, you know, two months sober from the cups. We'll see. Uh, he may, look, I'm sure, I'm sure there's many people listening to this who could call in with uh, uh, counterpoints. But he made, he made rehab sound really fun. I don't know what kind of rehab he was in. But um, I kind of want to get addicted to meth right now so that I can go go go-karting indirectly as a result of that. Yes, I know I could just go to the go-kart place and give them $12 and not have to get addicted to meth. That There's other ways to go go go-karting. And so I'll do that. All right. Thank you again, Ben. Call from Amy. Hello? Hello? Is this Lyle? Yes, it is. Oh my goodness. There's no one forwarding your calls this time. Um, what's going on? Well, um, there's several things. Okay. One of them being my dad wants me to start a food truck. <laughs> uh, okay. Your dad yeah. wants you to start a... You know, what kind of food truck are we talking? Tacos? Funnel cakes? 
Say again? It's a snow cone truck. Your dad wants you to start a snow cone truck. Is Do, do you have a family snow cone business that he wants you to take over? No, it's a franchise. It's a franchise. Is it his franchise? Uh, he has some in Virginia, but I'm in Denver, and he wants me to get one here. Okay. Um, how do you how how do you feel about the prospect of starting a snow cone business? It's not my dream. All right. But it might get me to my dream. What's your dream? I would like to start a farm. You like to start a farm, okay? Well, I mean, look—you could start the snowball business and think about it like it's a snowball farm. You start with snowballs, and then eventually, you know, dogs and shit. That's one way to look at it. Um. Well, I'm. Cu- you said that this that this snowball machine will the snowball truck can get you closer to your farm dreams. How do you think it will do that? Um, from everything that I've heard from other franchisees, it seems like a good way to make money. And Mm -hmm. I'm pretty young, so I don't really need to be on any kind of fast track. But I will say I also get some, like, climate anxiety, so I feel like I need to do things quickly. You get climate anxiety, like, oh, that the world is going to freeze over and we're all going to die? stuff like that yeah i don't think it's going to be one event but i think a lot of different events might culminate into like something not great well i'll say this if the climate changes and things start getting like obscenely hot great time to own a snowball truck you know what i didn't actually think about it that way that's a good point lyle thank you Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and you know i i feel like uh you could you'll, you'll be able to provide people a lot of uh, you know, serenity. Uh, before the, this comet hits us or whatever the fuck's gonna happen, that's that's not a bad way to die. Um, hit by a meteor while eating a skylight snow cone. I would love for it to be a quick impact. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, are I are you like? So you're all right. So your dream is to start a farm, and you're aware that that has some amount of like upkeep costs. Um. Yeah. And you want to try to raise those with the snow cone machine place. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And um, what the hell was I going to say? Uh, are you like weighing this snow cone thing against like another way to make money? Yeah. Um, I am doing an IT certification right now. Um, so that's one option. Um, but I don't know, then people are going to yell at me. It seems nicer to like hand out snow cones and not get yelled at. Um, are you afraid that people are going to yell at you while you're handing out the snow cones? Well, no, if I did like IT help desk, then probably people would call me all day and I don't want that. Oh yeah. IT, well, IT support, it's true Uh, because here's the thing is people will probably only be calling you if they are in a bad mood or if they have a problem that's been frustrating them for a while. And so you're going to get them in that mood. Well, and the thing is, like, originally when I was younger and for the longest time, I wanted to be a therapist or counseling psychologist. So I am really good at having patience and communicating with people who are in that kind of state. But I do think it might be more taxing than, like, manipulating children into eating sugar ice. <laughs> do, you, do, you look at, uh, do you look at a snow cone uh, truck as manipulating children into eating sugar? Um, yes, it's hard not to because my dad is the kind of guy to read, like, how to win friends and influence people. And he's like you need to compliment the children's shoes and then they'll want your snow cone or like you need flashing lights. And I'm like, that doesn't sound very ethical to me, but also, yeah, that's the whole thing. Um, I would stay for, you know, if I went up to a snowball truck and um, there was, you know, an old man in it giving me compliments on my outfit, I'd probably walk away. 
Well, children don't know any better. Um, what do you have a favorite kind of snow cone? Um, you know what? I'm not gonna lie. I haven't yeah. had many of the flavors. I haven't really done a lot of the. Um, like I'm in Denver, so I haven't worked on uh-huh. my dad's truck very much. But you don't sound like you like snow cones at all. I don't know what I like. I'm Gen Z, so I'm just kind of hate everything. Okay. Um, what job do you work now? I'm in between jobs. I just got fired from a cafe because I was. It was. It was. That was a different story. But yeah. Okay. Um. I mean, look. I, I kind of look. Here's here's what I'll say before we go. If you need a mascot for your snowball machine. Um, I'm down. I don't know how, I don't know if I inspire people to want to eat sugar. People, actually, people might look at me and go like, I don't, uh, I don't want to end up like that. And avoid the sugar. But who knows? You call them get cones. We could do that for a day. If you're ever back in Denver, I actually saw your live show when you were here last. So if you're ever back. Oh, you did? Oh hell yeah! yeah if hell you yeah! Want to sit outside my snow cone truck and watch kids play soccer or whatever it is they do. I would love that. By the way, what kind of farm do you want? To, is it like a dog? Is it like an animal farm or like a weed farm or like a? Well, I mean, what kind of crops are we talking? Yeah, um, I would love to have like community supported agriculture. So whatever crops are in season, I would love to share with the community for like a membership price. And okay. then I would love to have a dairy. Mm-hmm. Um, with like healthy cows and potentially that we would also grow weed who, who knows. But, um, my main thing is like, I want to be self-sustained and I want to be able to have a parallel structure to other things. Um, well, look, if you do this, you could just pretend like snowballs are in season. They're the in season crop and you're sharing them, uh, with, you're sharing the snowballs with the community. I think I might be able to do that. What is your name again? Amy, right? Yes. Uh, Well, Amy, good luck on your dream. Is there anything that you want to say to the people of the computer before we go? Um, I just would rather say to you, I've been trying to get on your uh, line for like two years now. I remember watching you at the beginning of COVID. And it's really exciting to talk to you. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Amy. I appreciate it. You have a good night. Thanks, you too. Call from Seth. Hello? Hi, hello. Hey, is this Seth? This is Seth, yes, hello. Hi, how are you? Uh, I'm all right, Seth. Um, what What's going on with you? Oh, uh, not much. I, I, I'm celebrating my uh, first year anniversary at my first uh, like big boy corporate job tomorrow. So that's pretty exciting. Okay. What this is the first year anniversary of the whole time you've been at your job? Yeah, yeah, I got the job last March seventh. All right, do you like it? I do for the most part. I like um, it's customer support like online, but it's um, kind of turning into more so managing like the automation of customer support. So it can be fun, but people can be really rude sometimes. <laughs> Even well, especially oh, yeah? online. But yeah, we what's some pretty the crazy people? What's the rudest thing somebody has said to you on on this job? Um, they, I I don't get it as bad as my coworkers do, but I've definitely like been told like that I'm a fucking idiot a lot, which is just funny because okay. usually it's not true. Like it's usually on them, but I mean, what do I know? Well, have, okay, I mean, be honest with me. Have you ever had yeah. somebody yell at you? Have you ever have you ever had somebody yell at you and call you a fucking idiot, and you were like? That was mean, but no, you you were right. I was I was no, nah, I was being stupid there. There's been moments where I'm like, yo, I definitely did not know what to like. I I definitely messed up. I've definitely had mess up moments, but never with the okay. rude people. It's always like okay. really nice people when I make a mistake. Whenever they're me, I'm I'm usually right. They're just usually mad about like refunds. They're usually they're pretty silly. So like I tell them mm. to do something three times in a row because they just won't do it. They won't they do the right troubleshooting. And I can't help you. If you won't do the right stuff. Now, wh- why do you think these people are upset? What do you think happened to them in their lives to make them want to yell at you? I'm going to be honest. I think they just went through 
a whole lot of nothing in their life, and I think they're very bored. And so okay. I think they, because uh, it's chat based, so it's just on a website. So I think they yeah. just get very, very bored, and they yeah. just want to go pick a fight with someone. Yeah, well, it's cathar- I, also the chat thing is is interesting because, um, you know, it's cathartic. Like, you know, sure. you had a bad like you had a bad day at uh, in your life. Maybe you maybe every day of your life has been a bad day. And yeah. then, uh, I, you know, they, they can take it out on you by typing fuck you into a chat. And they don't even have to see how you react to it because they just text you it. They don't even see that you are upset. So they there's no. Yeah, um, it's very true. Yeah, so they don't even get they they get it's kind of a total win win situation for them because they get to be mean, and mm-hmm. they don't get the the recoil of watching you cry, which may make them feel bad. Well, so they get to be mean without feeling bad. So I get you know I get why they do it. But I guess it works out then really well because usually it doesn't affect us because it's like I'm sitting at home working from home, just vibing. Like I literally just click off in the chat and go watch a movie. So we're both fine. Okay. I guess if he gets to release, I get to chill. You know, All right. so be it, right? All right. So I'm listen. From what you're telling me, it sounds like getting yelled at on the internet is has is a beautiful experience for everyone involved. It, I think it depends on the position you're in. I think if you're if you have to be like like you know kind of in your in your area of expertise, I feel like it wouldn't be as beneficial for everyone. But I'm behind a computer screen as well, and like they don't interact with me, and I can, I can very easily. I mean, it doesn't fucking affect me as much as it could affect someone that's in the limelight more so. What? How like, do they you don't know who I am? Like they don't know who I am. Like they can't go to like all my different socials and just consistently blow me up for like y- years on end. They have uh-huh. one route of getting to me, that's and so true. I block them from the one route. They kind of can't do anything. That's true, but all right, can I ask? Does any part of you like have you even have you ever tried going into this like you know honored to get yelled at? You know what I'm saying? Like, like you're you're making these people happy by letting them berate you on the computer. I I don't think it's an honored situation. There's some that I like go in because like my only other coworker who handles them, she's a like middle-aged um, woman and a lot of people we get calls in too and there's this one guy who calls in a lot who's very creepy to her um, uh-huh. and so I, I take the honor of taking his phone calls every time and dealing with him because he's just okay. creepy to me but if I can All stop right. from happening to her you know so you help your coworker, and this yeah. guy this phone call guy you give him someone to talk to yeah, and I try to deflect him. I mean, he he literally has asked to like meet up with her and asks her what she's doing and how she's like just everything about her. So we just try not to talk to him. But he has been paying our company for like five years, so it's a give and take, you know. Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't. I don't know what his life is. I don't know what any of you guys' lives are like, really. Um, I mean, yeah. I well, right now I'm to give you into my life. I'm living at home with my parents. Had to move back in year ago That's last fun. january yeah That's well fun. it is i'm excited to move out again but it's it's been fun what uh do you like your parents i do like my parents yes i got lucky what do you there. like what do you uh do you spend time with them while you're uh at home or do you try to avoid them to play computer games <laughs> i wouldn't say i try to avoid them but there's not much to do i live in a we live in a very small town uh, and so I just do spend a lot of time in my room just because if I were to interact with them all the time, we'd go crazy again, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that's fair. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I came back home, uh, recently and it's been nice. I was on a walk with my mom today and I was like, you know, I, fuck man, I'm over here trying to like travel the whole world and. Mm-hmm. Do all this, do a big fucking podcast thing, and I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I was on a walk with my mom. The it was nice outside, and the, my there was a dog, and I was like, you know, this is this is enough, really. Mm-hmm. Um, this is plenty. This is good. This do I ever... don't think this needs. You know, I don't think I need, um, you know, hookers and ecstasy. Although I don't know, maybe hookers and ecstasy would have, would make it nicer. I don't. Yeah. I haven't. 
Yeah, don't go knock ahead. Say you what you're going right? to say. Like, don't knock it you try it. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Sure. I mean, I've tried ecstasy. Oh, okay. Well, then maybe you would know. Do you think adding the hooker part would make it exponentially better? I don't know. I have no idea. That's the thing. But I, it really felt sure. like it was it was everything. You were going to say something. Well, I you know, I'm just going to ask, like, being home. You know, if I, if I can take over here for a quick second. Do you think being home? Yeah, sure. For me, being home has been in this small town. It's been kind of like pausing you know i know i've been here for much longer than you've been moved back home i think um or living back home or whatever you're doing back home so you're going to the tour soon so you're probably just staying with them but have you kind of like been a put of a pause and like realized that you don't need to be kind of go 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 all the time like given that we're young and trying to like make a name for ourselves uh, like I've, yeah. been, I've been trying to pause my life a little more and take it a little more slow since I've been yeah here i them. think yeah i think a pause is good um I don't know. I think um, I don't know. I I actually can I tell you something. I the other day I googled. I typed in what, Seth. Your name is yeah yeah Seth. I typed into Google how to be happy. I swear to God, I did this in full earnest. Really? I swear to God, I did it in full earnest because I don't know. And um, you know, part of me is see, seeks happiness in uh, you know go doing crazy whatever stuff and sure. then the other part is like you know on the walk with my mama ah, this is nice this is enough and i don't know i think it, there's a lot of variables there mm-hmm. that i'm not quite um well happiness is hard to achieve and it's hard oh, yeah. to unique for everyone sure but i think there's some basic like ground like building blocks to happiness sure. that everyone can like rely on Sure. Like for some people, what really truly brings them joy and happiness in life is to y- go on to chat rooms and yell at people uh, yeah. working customer no. yeah, service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you and so you provide them, you know, with that happiness for a brief moment yeah. of time. And I I get to have a pretty easy job and take a pretty easy, not, you know, sensible paycheck, which makes me happy as yeah. well. Yeah. Next time, so, well, have you ever tried sending back a frowning emoji and seeing if that they make they go like, ah, man, I made him feel bad. I should stop. I, I haven't sent back a frowning emoji, but I have sent back word for word the response I sent that made them angry because it was just the correct response. And I don't think that necessarily helps. Mm-hmm. Well, but I'm inspired. I'm going to go yell at somebody in a customer service chat room and see how that makes me feel. Okay. Yeah, give that it might a be shot. what was missing in my life. Honestly, I, these people never come back, so they have to be like good then, right? They healed in a way, I guess. Right, right, right. You know, you healed these. You healed these people. I like yeah. the way you're looking at it like that. I'm, I, I'm um, trying to put a positive spin. Seth, is there anything you want to say to the people at the computer before we go? You know, uh, I'm be honest. I found you in this podcast not even five hours ago. So it was just a pleasure to meet everyone. And uh, good luck on the tour, man. I hope you kill it. Thanks, man. How'd you find this, by the way? I'm just curious. I was looking on Spotify for a new podcast. And I was like 20, I was like two, three rows, like 20 different podcasts and on the comedy podcast. And I saw this. And I was like, you know what? I think I saw a short or an Instagram reel or something of you a year ago, maybe. And I was like, I remember this being kind of fun. So I just tapped in and listened to the most recent podcast you had with the demon guy. Heck yeah. That was interesting. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I hope he's... Not summoning demons. I hope he's given that a break for now, at least. Just a, a nice week break. Thanks for calling, Seth. You're welcome. Have a good day. Some people like uh, going on walks. Some people yell at folks in chat rooms. Some people summon demons. There's no wrong answers. There's no wrong answers.